The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and we are at the interview part of the show. Um, uh, of course, uh, joining me today for co-hosting is Brian Turnoff. Hey, Brian. Hey, hey. Always a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Geez, we've got a really interesting episode here. Um, this is about a book that's been uh, re republished, and... Um, well, let's just get right into it. So we've got John Morgan Wilson on the line. Thank you for being here, John. Thanks, Alan. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. So, so John, let, let's talk about the book first. It's called Simple Justice, and it's a Benjamin Justice Mystery Book One. Now, um, when did you originally write this? Uh, this I wrote this back in '95. Uh, I'd been uh, working in journalism for oh gosh, about 30 years at that point. I was just turning 50, and I had moved into television, and I wanted to make a transition to some kind of writing that I could put my heart and soul into. Uh, television was a great way to make a living. I'd work a five, six month gig in, in fact-based TV or documentary TV, and then I'd have uh, some time off to myself. And, and I kind of had a talk with myself and asked what I really wanted to do, and something very serendipitous happened. A friend recommended that I read Walter Mosley's uh, Devil in a Blue Dress, and <clears throat> I hadn't read a lot of mysteries since I was, uh, oh, maybe 18, 19, 20 years old. I'd... I'd uh, just lost my interest in reading mysteries, but I read a lot of them as a kid, starting with Hardy Boys, but then all the classic mystery writers. And I thought about writing a mystery novel because I was inspired by Devil in a Blue Dress, not just the writing, which was so clean and lean and spare, yet evocative and and beautifully crafted, uh, Mosley, such a fine writer, but the way that uh, he crossed social issues uh, with uh, a good mystery story and a period piece. And I started thinking about something like that that I might do, but with a gay protagonist. Uh, there had been a lot of uh, gay-themed mysteries written and published at that time, some very fine ones, and, of course, uh, Joseph Hansen and Michael Nava being among the two great pioneering uh, uh, gay mystery writers. And out of that, I started thinking about a story that ended up being Simple Justice, and I sat down and wrote it in about six weeks, the first draft in about six weeks. And then I, of course, came back and spent many, many weeks and even a couple, two, three months uh, rewriting. And that was how Simple Justice was born, and I set it in the journalism world because I'd been a print journalist for a long, long time. A lot of that time spent at the L.A. Times, uh, either on staff or, or freelancing, but I'd freelanced for major newspapers all over the country and many magazines. And So I set it in the newspaper world, and I set it in West Hollywood where I lived, and uh, that's how Benjamin Justice was born. Wow, from... Uh... In the in the in the early nineties too. So from Monica's blue dress to the devil in the blue dress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was uh, yeah it was ninety five and it was published in ninety six. Uh, uh, my agent sold it really fast. We we had made a four book deal with Doubleday, and everything just happened very very fast. Uh, I didn't even know a lot about the the mystery publishing world at the time i just wrote this novel that i really wanted to write and um, everything happened from there i just wondered okay so this is like your first novel and um how how your character benjamin justice um how you developed that character where where did where did he come from well i'll tell you this is Maybe the one most interesting thing about Benjamin Justice was he turned out to be, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> he turned out to be someone very different than I originally imagined. When I sat down to write, uh, 
I didn't really have him fully formed in my head. I, I was going to kind of find out who he was as I went along, which I think is the way it ends up being for most writers anyway. We can outline and we can do uh, biographies of our characters if that's what we choose to do. There's all kinds of approaches to it, but ultimately it's it's what you write on the page and how the character uh, develops uh, as you move along. And from the minute I wrote in the first person, I've never I hadn't written fiction since college when I wrote short stories, and I'd never written in the first person before, and I don't even know why I started writing in the fir first person. It wasn't intentional. I just started writing, and and boom, in the first person, I this voice just took over, and it was the voice of my lead character, since it was a first-person narrative, and that was how Benjamin Justice was born. He was born right on the page from the first line, and uh, it became uh, a character who I've described him as my darker, more reckless, more courageous alter ego. Uh, I didn't think about that at the time. I just wrote and wrote and wrote, and um, uh, he just kind of spilled out on the page. There was a lot of emotion in it, a lot of my own life filtered into the, the character and into his world. Um, it isn't biographical, but certainly there was a lot of me in my life uh, uh, in, the, in the character, in the shadows. Um, and that's how he came to be born, and that's how, that's how he developed. Wow. So how do you feel about your character? I, and I ask that because a lot of... Uh, fiction writers, uh, crime fiction writers especially, when I ask them um, what they, how they relate to their, to their characters, quite a few of them say it's their, it's like their kids, uh, or something like that. So, how, what's your feeling on your characters? Uh, well, he's definitely a lot like my kids. Stephen Rains, who just uh, did a, a Q and A with me for the Lambda. Literary Review asked me a similar question. He said, what was it like to go back and re-inhabit Benjamin Justice after all these years? And I told him it was maddening, exasperating, uh, but also exhilarating because Justice is such a tough guy to live with. And when I go back to these books and when I wrote them the first time, I really feel like I'm living in their world uh, and inside their skins, or at least I try to, especially with Benjamin Justice, since he's my lead character and I write in the first person, I try to write from inside him and, and, and kind of let him pour out on the page. And uh, I don't think of him tenderly, really, because he can be abrasive and opinionated. He's often violent. Uh, he's often his own worst enemy. He carries a lot of demons with him. Uh, but in the end, he tries to do the right thing. And so he's not an easy guy to live with, but I do have uh, a kind of, of dark fondness for him. And when I uh, get back and write in his voice, uh, I kind of go along for the ride and see, you know, see where it takes me. Wow, that's interesting. Now, now the characters that you write in the book besides uh, Benjamin, um, do, do they come from a particular place uh, that's the same? Are you the type of guy that will see someone walking through a mall or someone at a coffee shop? Or is it perhaps someone you know, you've been to school with or worked with? Um, where do all the ex extra characters come from? You know, the, my characters come the same way ideas for, for novels or short stories come from, and that is all over the place. I could, you know, talk for an hour about where these, these ideas come from. And often I think we don't really know or remember or aren't real clear about how uh, we were inspired. Uh, uh, sometimes they, they start with just a name. I, I always name my characters right away, and uh, it's sort of just from my gut. Uh, and sometimes they'll develop from there. Sometimes it's someone, like you said, passing on the street. I used to sit at, uh, on the corner here in West Hollywood at, at the Starbucks that's uh, down the way, uh, a few blocks from my house. And I would just sit there and watch people go by and look at characteristics, how they walked, how, what, what the details of their clothing was. Uh, what they were carrying, how they carried themselves, what their haircut was like, etc. Just all those concrete details. And sometimes characters would come that way. Sometimes 
characters would come just because of where the plot was moving and uh, they'd come in out of action but from there you've got to find out uh, you know if they really belong in the story do they have a purpose within the story uh, do they feel authentic and real to you or do they feel stilted and cardboard and made up can you develop them better and find find kind of the heart and soul of a character um, they just develop in so many ways it's a tough question to answer yeah so this is your 25th anniversary for this book uh, and it's being re-released um, you you said you've done some rewriting or reworking with it um, what was the main reworking part that you did like what was it that needed to be changed well, when Requeer Tales, uh, or actually before Requeer Tales was born, um, a group of writers uh, uh, from a Facebook uh, crime writing fa uh, fan page had approached me about helping me get my books back in print. John Michelson, who's an author in Atlanta, uh, had first contacted me to um, uh, be interviewed for his blog, and he found out the books were going out of print, and I wasn't going to do anything to bring them back. And then he got this group together from his Facebook uh, Facebook uh, group, and they offered their own particular specialized skills to help me bring the book back in self-publication. And I wasn't really keen on getting into the challenges of taking on the challenges of, of self-publication, but what happened, and, and it's kind of extraordinary, was from this group evolved a, a core group of people who decided to not just handle my book but to form a full-fledged traditional uh, royalty paying publisher and bring back a lot of LGBT uh, titles that were going out of print both uh, crime fiction but also literary fiction a wide range and that group became Requeered Tales I call them RQT for short and uh, RQT has now published uh, more than 30 books in less than two years. They, they'll uh, bring out 40 more titles next year. It's really quite a remarkable story. And when I got involved with them and they were preparing the contracts and all of that, I reread my first book. And honestly, I was shocked by a lot of the writing that I thought needed a lot more work. Uh, I, in the first chapter alone, I read half a dozen cliches that I made me wince. I, I was really <laughs> surprised by uh, the problem. So I kept reading the, the book, which wasn't a pleasant experience for me, but I was fortunate to have done this before the book was republished. I found inconsistencies in the plot that were never caught by my editors at Doubleday. Um, uh, there were um, mistakes of fact errors of fact and mo the, the thing that bothered me the most was some ragged writing uh, verbiage that needed to be trimmed and tightened and um, these plot inconsistencies that needed to be fixed because the plot hinges on a timeline of details and those I got those wrong in the book no one ever caught this at least no one who ever notified me <laughs> over 25 years but I caught it myself because I went back and did a whole grid of all the whole timeline of the plot and realized, oh my gosh, I got to fix this. So I told RQT, go ahead with your other authors. I'm going to rewrite this book from page one to last. I'm going to need some time. And I just started re rewriting as if uh, my book. Uh, which by then had been through several uh, iterations in its original form, several publishers in reprints, I started taking the book that was published back in 96, which won an Edgar Award, so it couldn't have been terrible, but it was terrible to me, and I, I treated it as a first draft and rewrote from there. Most of it is still intact. Most of the plot is still intact. Uh, but I cleaned up a lot of the writing. The first thing I did was to eliminate whole passages, whole sections. Um, I cut about 2,000, 3,000 words out of the book uh, in total. And um, I eliminated a couple of characters. I created a couple of new characters. I eliminated two minor subplots. 
uh, I just tried to fix it to make it better. And a lot of that comes, you know, after 25 years, hopefully you're a better writer than you were 25 years earlier with your first novel. The thing about writing first novels is you're learning on the job effectively, and that's what I was doing. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity, one, for Requeer Tales to have the patience waiting for me to finish my revisions, and two, just to revisit the material and try and fix some things and, and uh, make it better. I hope that's what I accomplished. I, w- I would think so. I, I, you know, as a writer myself, I, I kind of go back to older stuff and always um, cringe uh, at times. But I think, I think that's a natural progress. Yeah, indeed. Uh, you just you get better at it. Uh, you get older, so you don't necessarily. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to clear my throat. <laughs> you get older, so you don't necessarily have the the physical um, and mental stamina you did. So I can't sit down and work 15 hours a day anymore like I did when I wrote the the first draft in six weeks back in '95. Uh, so I I had to pace myself a little more, uh, but. You know, you should be sharper in your skills, and you should be a more mature person with more insights about things. And, and uh, something else that happened that was interesting, I was doing uh, the bulk of my rewriting in the first half of 2020, and this was while the pandemic was taking hold and the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement was having this resurgence, and we were in the midst of all this uh, political upheaval, uh, my novel set in 1994, which was a pivotal election year uh, and a political, uh, a conservative political resurgence in the middle of an epidemic, AIDS, uh, with with all kinds of social protest going on, uh, women's rights, equal rights, uh, the AIDS epidemic, and so forth. And the parallels were really interesting. So I was rewriting my night. 19- my novel set in 1994 in West Hollywood, but we had Black Lives Matter protests going past the house two weeks, uh, two week, excuse me, two blocks away, and uh, it was interesting to be rewriting when there were so many parallels between then and now. And ultimately, I think it did affect some of the way uh, I rewrote some of the material, if only unconsciously. I do have one character in the novel, Alexandra Templeton, who becomes the partner of Benjamin Justice in investigating a murder outside a gay bar in Silver Lake. That's the main plot. And that murder has racial overtones of its own, involving a young Hispanic teenager who confesses to the crime uh, and Justice suspects that his confession is false, and he is partnered with Alexandra Templeton, excuse me, Alexandra Templeton, a young black reporter, and they begin investigating together. And I found in revisiting her character that I, I needed to pay her character more respect as an author. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it was just something I felt. And it wasn't anything major. It was just something as I rewrote her uh, from a different viewpoint or perhaps a viewpoint affected by current events, I saw her a little differently. I wanted to give her more due. And uh, she was uh, one character I focused a lot on in the rewriting. uh, And I think she's a much stronger, more dignified character because of it. She was always a very positive uh, figure in the book before, a very important figure. But I think she's a more uh, 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 mature and confident and, and person now, and I, I think her dignity is more more intact along the way. And the, like we said, the setting of the novel is 1994 Los Angeles, and you, you briefly touched on it a little bit. But um, you know, there's the idea that some things never change, some things never stay the same. I mean, how does that expression apply to Los Angeles then and now? Well, you know, a lot has changed, certainly in West Hollywood. The book is set in West Hollywood and then environments around uh, environs around Southern California from Silver Lake and the Valley down to Laguna Beach. And so much has changed uh, uh, in terms of, one thing, the AIDS epidemic is not behind us. It's still with us, but now people are living. 
and in those days they were dying. And as I rewrote the book, um, I, I re- because of the pandemic that was happening around me now, when I revisited the AIDS epidemic, I think it caused me to pay more attention to the emotional impact of AIDS on my character, Benjamin Justice, because in the book he's lost his lover to AIDS, and also the other characters around him. Uh, so there was that connection between then and now. Uh, the city of West Hollywood itself has changed a lot because it felt almost like a small town then. Now it's this kind of big, glamorous, slick city with a lot of development going on. Uh, it still has a really strong political and social issue sensibility about it, but uh, it's also become heavily developed. And now instead of having hundreds of people come in, uh, on the weekends uh, to enjoy a few bars and clubs. Now we have thousands and thousands of people come in on the weekends to enjoy probably a dozen or more clubs within a six-block, eight-block radius. And uh, so some some things have changed, others haven't, but certainly the parallels are, are there between then and now. What kind of... Um I'm just wondering, when, what kind of influences do you have um, on your writing? In terms of what I read? Yeah, think? yeah. If there's some, if there's some authors or there's certain books that um, sort of sort of work their way into the way you write. Well, you know, I think it's again, it's one of those things that's it's hard to parse that out. But I can I can identify probably a few. Some of it goes way back to when I was a kid. Um, uh, perhaps the storytelling more than style or voice or something like that. But I started out with the Hardy Boys and was hooked from the start. We used to buy in those days, and I'm 70, about to turn 75. So this is uh, back. I started reading the Hardy Boys uh, in the early 50s. And there was a whole group of us in fifth grade, and we would, uh, uh, you could get a hard cover or a cloth cover, they called them then, of the Hardy Boys. It would, a new one would come out, and they cost a dollar. So we would pool our money, and each guy would go spend a dollar, and we'd get three, four books at a time, and then we'd pass them around. And I really became hooked, but my mother, who was an English major and taught English for for uh, leisurely reading, she loved mysteries. So I had everything around to start reading from when I was old enough. And I remember uh, reading everything from Perry Mason and Agatha Christie to uh, uh, Raymond Chandler and and, uh, Ross MacDonald eventually. But the one uh, writer who stands out in my memory is really influencing me was G.K. Chesterton and the Father Brown series. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but these were short stories that were character-driven books, and they weren't, I don't think I ever read one that was about murder. It might be a simple story about someone stealing a set of silver spoons, but it would be told in a way that you got deep into the character and into the world, and this plot about the silver spoons would simply be a conduit for letting you travel with this character into their world. And I remember those were the most engrossing to me. And I really became hooked on more character-driven writing. And later, as I, as I, I read uh, Mysteries, Patricia Highsmith, Graham Greene uh, were particularly strong influences. I loved their writing. I found it intelligent. I loved the characters. Uh, I became immersed in those worlds. Uh, they made you think... Uh, Green, of course, was always uh, kind of a moralist, making you think about the morality of the characters. Highsmith could be more chilling, but um, uh, those were a couple of the the most influential characters uh, that that influenced me. I think as I got older, and and today I just I'll read. I'm still reading older stuff. I just read uh, In a Lonely Place. Uh, with an introduction by Megan Abbott, or not an introduction, but actually uh, she wrote an afterword by by uh, Megan Abbott, and uh, it was fascinating because it's set in West Hollywood and Beverly Hills and Santa Monica, which are all 
areas that I live in. I live in West Hollywood, just a block off the Beverly Hills border. And uh, the same streets, the same neighborhoods, the same buildings, but uh, set back in the, I believe it was back in the 50s. Uh, so I'm still still reading, but I probably read more non-genre writing these days than uh, genre writing, because uh, I, I really do enjoy character-driven stuff. So what, what do you uh, suggest um, for a new writer, someone that's just hasn't been published yet that that's writing um what do you say that they should do first learn to read not as a reader but as a writer learn to read and start x-raying what you're reading seeing what's there that guides you uh, asking questions as you read uh, why is this working? Why do I like this? What am I responding to? How did the author get into the novel quickly or in an engaging way? Uh, uh, what are the things about the book that you like and what are the techniques the writer is using to uh, uh, get you there, to grab you, to keep you, to keep the story going? What are the structural techniques? What are, are the uh, stylistic techniques? Uh, look at a. I would say look at a book. Well, let me clear that a second. First of all, I think if you're going to sit down and write your first novel, write from your heart and your gut. Write the book you were born to write. Write the book that you were meant to write. Write from your heart. Write from your soul because that's the book that's going to be the best book you can write, and that's the most likely one to find an agent, find a publisher, find an audience and it's going to be the best book you can write. So I would start there. But as a reader, learn to read as a writer now. Your job as a writer is to look for the techniques that other writers are doing as they write. Ask what's working, what's not working. Why am I getting bored during this passage? What is the writer doing that is causing me to lose interest? What could be done differently? What would I do if I were writing this section? Uh, uh, those are that was one of the most important things to me as a journalist was to study other journalists writing to see how they did it and then if you write enough you'll eventually bring your own voice your own style to it uh, you tend to start out copying I think but you have to write and write and write to find your voice and to fa find your natural writing style a lot of people want it to happen instantly and you just have to do an awful lot of writing before you start to get comfortable with it and start to, to find your natural voice and rhythms, I think. Uh, one thing I would say, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought, so I'll let you grab this one. Uh, well, Simple Justice uh, and the other Benjamin Justice uh, books, they're, they're being re reissued under Requeered Tales. Um, and, and you're an openly gay man. Do you think that you've been pegged as a gay writer or, you know, if that connotation has helped or hurt your career, or do you feel some responsibility, to, you know, to carry the flag for other uh, L LGBTQ um, writers? Honestly, I don't think I'm famous enough or successful enough to be pegged <laughs> as anything. Uh, I, I haven't been branded. I don't have a brand. Uh, the thing about writing is I've been out of the game for a while in that respect. I, I've never stopped writing because I write short stories, I write op-ed pieces, and now I'm back rewriting all eight books in the Benjamin Justice series. So I'm a busy writer. That's that's not a problem. But I, I think, you know, Christopher Rice, who's a friend of mine, and he wrote the foreword to this this uh, uh, revised new edition of Simple Justice, he's, he's writing um, a whole different kind. He's into fantasy now. And he started out writing uh, gay mysteries, and then they became thrillers, and now he's, he's writing fantasy. So I think you can write anything you want to write as long as it's good, uh, as long as it's your best, as long as it's well-crafted, as long as you're, you're paying enough attention to the marketplace and uh, uh, sort of the, the machinations of publishing that you can wend your way through it. And that's not easy. That's, that's the 
part of the game that can be difficult for people like me who just want to write and, and, and are not that interested in marketing and, and publicity and, and all, all the rest of it, uh, the business side of it. Uh, but you have to be to some extent if you, you want to reach an audience. Uh, social networking has changed everything. So writers today, if they want to sell some books, um, and of course not everyone, not everyone has to get into this because there's a lot of people self-publishing now. That wasn't a route I ever wanted to take, but more and more are taking that route. And if you go into self-publishing, you have to pay even more attention to the business side, more attention to the editing side, because you're going to be doing all of that or most of that yourself. And I think if you're going into self-publishing and you really want to put out uh, writing that is good and valuable and well-crafted, you're going to have to work even harder than a lot of uh, uh, writers who take the tr traditional route where you've got uh, editors and agents and and the marketing divisions and so forth doing so much of the work for you. You get to keep more of the money though if you if you, you know, hit a jackpot. So that's the the plus side of that. You know, it's interesting, you know, when you um wrote this uh book 1, you know, AIDS was a was a big thing uh, you know, and now with the COVID, um when you look at the two different um health problems that's going on um do you think as a as as a society we've gotten better at it or worse i'm sorry better at what better at dealing with um such uh, tragedies and such things as, as aids and and covid well you know they're, they they've been such different epidemics and this one is now a path that pandemic, which puts it in even a whole other level because it's spreading so fast uh, and the numbers are so huge. Um, and maybe the numbers, uh, actually I shouldn't even say that because the, the numbers are in the tens of millions uh, around the world with AIDS over, over uh, the last whatever it is, 40 years, but 40, 50 years now. No, 40 years. Um, Boy, I'm losing my train of thought on that one. Uh, the response, the response of the government from AIDS to the response of the government to um, COVID-19 and the pandemic, it's interesting because there are similarities and and there are dissimilarities. AIDS had the stigma of being the gay disease. Nobody wanted to talk about that. Uh, the New York Times was reluctant to mention as a gay disease or to put on the front page or, or people were uh, leery of talking about, people didn't want anyone to know they had it, et cetera, et cetera. It was the terribly stigmatized disease. We don't have that with COVID-19 because it hit hard and fast and it was a strain of similar to flu and so you don't have that stigma about COVID-19 that you did with AIDS. On the other hand, we had a government that was in denial at the beginning stages. It was a hoax. It was going to magically disappear, et cetera, et cetera. That was in denial about uh, COVID-19, just as the government was in denial about uh, AIDS during the Reagan years. Uh, so there is there is a similarity in that respect, but this this one is completely different in the sense that the stigmatization is not there the way it was with AIDS. Does writing during dark times like that um, affect the way you write? Uh, are, uh, so are you talking about the original writing the original book? Yeah, writing the original book, and you could even add to the revision because during the revision we've got like. All right. the things going on now. I was just wondering if it's if it if it seeps into the way you write. Does it make you, uh, you know, if something really traumatic like that and a lot of things are going on and it's uh, protests and and people dying and all this, um, does it put a darker tone on the way you write? When I sat down to write um, Simple Justice back in '95. Uh, I had a talk with myself, and I said, you've got to reach deeper than you've ever reached if you want to do this well. I was really at a transition point. I'd had a good career as a print journalist, 
Um, I was working in television, making a decent income uh, on TV shows uh, in the fact-based and documentary areas, but I really wanted to write fiction, and I probably wanted to write it most of my life. I just hadn't been willing to admit it to myself or had the gumption to do it. So I had this talk with myself about you've got to be more honest and more authentic than you've ever been uh, with as a journalist. Uh, and, because as a journalist, you can hide behind other people's facts and figures and quotes. Uh, and a lot of reporters do. They, they, they keep themselves out of it. But with fiction, if it's going to feel real to people, even if it's not biographical, you're going to have to write from a real authentic place within yourself and find that honest voice in which to create your novel and create your characters and create the world. And when I started writing, it was like therapy every day for me. That's how I was able to write that novel, I think, in six weeks. I couldn't wait to get up in the morning. And I would write until 10 o'clock at night, from 7 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, break for two meals, two quick naps, back to work. And I couldn't wait to get up the next morning and start again. And a lot of it came out of uh, the age of AIDS that I lived in. Uh, I came out in the early 70s, around 72, 73. And AIDS in, struck in the early to mid-80s. We got signs of it in the early 80s before the rest of the world did, those of us who were in the gay movement and were activists and so forth as I was. And I lost a lover to AIDS uh, in 87, 80, uh, 80, yeah, 87, and uh, people were dying all around me. I lost any number of friends. Most of my uh, small gay circle of friends died of AIDS during that period. Uh, I had a lot of straight friends, really close, my oldest friends, and they were untouched. But most of my gay friends passed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so when I sat down to write, that just be became a part of it without me. I never thought AIDS was going to be a part of my story. I was going to write a more traditional murder mystery and uh, uh, strong plot, suspense, so forth. Uh, but then AIDS worked itself in right from the first chapter. And uh, it darkened the tone. Uh, I think it darkened the character. And uh, it, it's continued. And in the revisions, if anything, it continued to darken that tone that was in the first novel. It, the first novel, the original publication, is a very dark novel. People should be prepared for that if they're interested in, in taking a look at simple justice. And when I went back with the, ma the pandemic, we're currently in all around me, people dying. Uh, my stepmother died uh, in assisted living during uh, uh, the pandemic. We don't know if she died of COVID-19 or not, but she died during that period. My, one of my younger brothers had died a few months before the pandemic struck of, of uh, myotonic dystrophy, which is a terrible crippling disease. So when I sat down to write again, I was dealing, or revise Simple Justice, I was dealing with loss all over again, and the two really kind of joined and blended together. And uh, the story ended up pretty dark, it, but it, I think it really helped the story. It, uh, it uh, brought out details and characters in sharper relief, uh, and the emotional impact of AIDS uh, in sharper relief as I wrote. Uh, I was very aware of that part. And uh, in the end, I think if you're writing something that's real and authentic and true to who you are and what you feel, uh, these things are going to come out on the page and your writing is going to be stronger for it. So at, when someone comes and picks up your book, like it's uh, due to be released September 15th, re-released, I should say, the new version, um, so they pick up the book and they read it. Um, what is it that you hope they take away w from it? Uh, you know, I would never, I would never say that. I just hope it's the best book I could write under the circumstances. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying it's great. I would never claim that it's a masterpiece. If I had more time right now and hadn't had deadlines I finally had to meet, I would still be revising. <laughs> There's things about the plot I would uh, probably still want to improve or clean up. But 
I did the best I could uh, within the time frame I had and who I was at the time. And I, a lot of times people will read a book and they'll say, oh, this, his last one was better, or I wish this was better in some way. A writer can only write the best book he or she can write at any given time in life. And all kinds of forces and factors come into play. Uh, how old you are, what your health is like, what your emotional state is is like, what your living situation is like, your economic situation, all kinds of factors. And all you can do is, is write the best book you can at any given time and give it your all. And if all I can hope for is, with this book is that's what I did. I did my best. And the reader will have to take away from it what they take away from it because each of us uh, as a reader is as different as each writer is different and you never know who's going to take what away from it I just hope people enjoy the book and uh, I did what I could uh, to make improvements this time around and uh, that's about all I can do yeah, well, it's all any of us can do. <laughs> That's great. Um, do you have uh, social media going? Do you have like a website or anything that people can go to or uh, where they can follow you? Several years ago, I uh, really withdrew. I knew the series, uh, the Benjamin Justice series, was going to go out of print. I didn't have plans to bring it back. I stopped my Facebook page after many, many years because I really wasn't attending to it, and I felt bad because I was getting 400, 500 happy birthday wishes, <laughs> and I just wasn't uh, interacting with these folks. And I had these good readers and these people who cared, and I, I had so much else going on in my life that I needed to take care of, and I... Did, I, I was starting to feel guilty about that, so I ended my Facebook page, and then I dropped my author's my, my author website for the same reason. I really kind of wanted to withdraw to a lower profile and just write short fiction and, a, and an occasional op-ed piece, which which I still do. And uh, so, no, I have no author's website, but they can go to Read Queered Tales, and there's an author page there, um, and it's you can't really get to me directly but if anybody has some you know keen need to, to get in touch I suppose they could do it through the requeered tales website it's www requeered r e q u e e r e d tales t a l e s dot com requeered tales dot com and I'm afraid that's the best I can do at this point well that's just fine, actually. And what we'll do is we'll put your book up so people can buy it that are listening, and also the uh, Requeered Tales website, so people. Have oh, I appreciate. I yeah. appreciate that. And honestly, I think reading Christopher Rice's foreword is worth the price of the book. He wrote a wonderful foreword, not just because it's flattering to me. It is. It's you know I was blushing a little when I read it. He was very kind, very generous, but. He writes a piece that really is is an essay about uh, the gay liberation movement and gay mystery writing uh, and putting all that into perspective in the introduction to this book that I really think is quite eloquent and I, and kind of stands on its own. So I, I really want to thank him for that. Wow, fantastic. Add that It always adds uh, something to the book as well, something like that. That's great. That's great. So what do you got planned next? Have you got anything going up uh, after this? I have to get back and straighten out my life. I haven't even paid my 2019 taxes yet. <laughs> I keep taking extensions, but I've got to get it done by October 15th and, and about a 100 other things because when I write, the rest of the world falls away, and I am immersed in whatever I'm working on. And uh, this is a long, long revision process on simple justice. So I'm going to take care of getting my life back in order, and then I am going to sit down with the second book in the series, Revision of Justice, and uh, dig in on that one and see if I can uh, make it a better book. Wow! It'll be released. Uh, it'll be released next year, 2021. Yeah, sound like you got a busy, busy future ahead of you in writing. 
<laughs> yeah, a few years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, uh, the book we're talking about is uh, Simple Justice, and it's a Benjamin Justice mystery, and it's book one. The release date is September 15th. And that is the uh, new version of it. And um, again, the author's been our guest, John Morgan Wilson. Thank you for being here. Alan, thank you. Thank to, thanks to both you guys. Uh, uh, it was really an honor to be on your show, and, and I appreciate you having me. Feeling mutual. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.